Hello, and thank you for joining me for this breakout session for Podcast Movement 2021. I'm Donna Barrow-Green, and I'm a writer and the creator of the literary fiction podcasts, The Diarist and Exuberance's Beauty. This session is an introduction to literary fiction podcasting. I call it Literary Fiction 101 because I want to give you a snapshot into the possibilities of long-form storytelling using the audio medium. After a brief introduction to the genre, I'll jump right in and take you on a tour of creating a literary fiction podcast. Over the next 45 minutes, you'll have the opportunity to sit in with me as I adapt a scene from one of my novels and work in the sound studio to bring it to life. This breakout session introduces podcasters to key elements of literary fiction podcasting with an overview of adapting prose for audio scripting and designing soundscape for exposition, background, foreshadowing. I'll provide audio clip examples and some real-time screen sharing, mixing sound and adapting prose. I hope that by the end of this presentation, you'll be inspired to adapt your own story to audio fiction. I've created a set of handouts with resources. You may want them available to reference during parts of the video. Because this is a recorded session and I can't answer questions real time, I've created opportunities to address frequently asked questions. When you see the question mark icon, I'll make a quick note on a related topic and this will be referenced in the hands out, handouts. Okay, let's get started. A bit about me. I am a college instructor and writer living in Portland, Oregon. I'm a novelist and playwright, and in 2017, I got curious about audio drama. I decided to adapt a novel I was working on at the time called The Diarist. Through trial and error, I explored how to adapt prose to audio script and production. Mind you, I knew nothing about audio script writing nor sound engineering. The process allowed me to explore storytelling for podcasting. The Diarist is the story of Andrea Davies, a 1950 secretary working for an advertising firm in Manhattan. Think Mad Men, think Jane Eyre, think David Lynch. Hard to conjure? Okay, listen. <laughs> Just about done with that contract? Yes, I'm done with it. I hope to never see another contract from Studebaker again. I don't blame you. Listen, I want to tell you what I found out yesterday. Gossip? Mrs. Hayes is back in the hospital again. Waterville State Hospital. She had an attack again last night. What kind of attack? It's a lunatic asylum. <laughs> See the way all that was conveyed? That's what we'll be talking about today. After completion of the 27 episode season one and 100,000 downloads, I put the diarist on the shelf for a bit. I turned to my novel, Exuberance's Beauty. For reasons I'll discuss in a moment, Exuberance's Beauty posed a few challenges in adapting literary fiction podcasting. We just completed season one with 10 episodes and season two is in production. The context and themes are heavier than the diarist. I'll focus a lot on these literary challenges in today's presentation on literary fiction podcasting. Okay, so what is literary fiction podcasting? Literary fiction podcasting breathes life into long form stories with an arc that stretches across a season of episodes with escalating dramatic tension. The result is a fully cast immersive audio experience akin to popular bingeable drama series storytelling for the screen. This is a new emerging audio drama subgenre, and there aren't many examples to draw from. Think of literary fiction podcasting as audiobook meets radio play with a splash of limited series drama. So what makes a fiction podcast literary? Most fiction podcasts are somewhere between episodic and serial. You can jump in on any episode and you won't be totally lost. Each episode has a problem, i.e. like a story of the week. And that problem is usually solved by the end of the show. Same characters, same world. Likely a protagonist has a vague super objective and there are subplots. Yet the story is not bound by a larger plot structure. 
Serialized literary podcasts, on the other hand, are sequential and have to be listened to in order as the story builds. Listeners make an investment for the big payoff and reveal at the end. You have a problem or conflict in every episode, and that engages the listener. But these subplots are all leading to a bigger story arc. Consider the TV show Mad Men. This is a good example of an episodic show with evolving plots. Now, compare this with Handmaid's Tale. This show is serialized with deep investment in characters, theme, and most of all, story. So to understand the story, one must listen from the beginning to the end in order. The plot diagram is a good way to look at the difference between episodic and literary serialized stories. So literary fiction podcasting is long form, meaning the arc carries over all the episodes for one bigger story. Similarly, audiobooks follow long form, but they don't stray from written prose the way scripted literary podcasting does. The literary elements, which I'll be talking about in the context of adapting long form fiction, are addressed through sound, mood, and subtext in the dialogue. Why is this important? Because in literary fiction podcasting, you'll need to think about engaging listeners in each episode with an episode arc and also engaging them in the bigger narrative arc. Luckily, chapters or book parts usually follow the same rules of narrative. An important question to ask is, who is interested in serial long form fiction podcasts? These listeners want to make the commitment to invest in the characters and be fully drawn in and immer immersed in the story. So there's a big commitment up front. As I said, it's an emerging subgenre of fiction podcasting. And just like folks who love to binge nonfiction serials like, well, Serial, Dr. Death, or any journalistic long form podcast, the audience for long form fiction podcasting are those folks who like to get lost in a story. They probably love audiobooks and television limited series dramas. Okay, I'll give you some additional resources in the handouts and a copy of a plot worksheet. Remember, you're adapting long form prose to audio script and production. So, ostensibly, you have all the plot points already developed and the story arc is in place. Now you are breaking it down and ready to start writing and producing. Okay, we've talked about the overall structure and the big takeaway is you'll need to be sure to have a larger story arc and each episode needs to have its own arc with a problem to be solved. Each of these problems or conflicts that are building the story and carrying the listener with it. Because it's a longer story, it requires more investment from the listener. And because there are mechanics that underlie any long form story, you'll need to account for these literary elements as you adapt. Different genres and literary paradigms require different elements. Why? Because you are suturing your listener into the story. What is suturing? Suturing your listener is the way the story medium, in this case audio, works with our psyche so that we enter the imaginary world's conventional narrative so that we listen beyond the techniques, codes, conventions that create these worlds. It's the invisibility of these means. We become one with the podcast and lose ourselves in it. Okay, I'm gonna stop for a moment and use an example from my own podcast, Exuberance is Beauty. In this episode set in the 1940s, Eve and Jeff have decided to go to a movie and meet up, pretending to be strangers, playing with the danger of their illicit affair. For this clip, I use stock music and sounds of old, an old fashioned movie theater. I embedded cues to the time period in the dialogue and context. Close your eyes and listen to the clip. Excuse me, sir. Would you mind if I got past? Not at all. Thank you. What a horrible couple of girls. I'll say. I'm sorry you had to see that. Who's this Hank? Would you like some popcorn? I have my own. 
Uh, oh no, look what I've done. I spilled popcorn all over my seat. Um, would you mind if I moved over one? Uh, not at all. Are you enjoying the movie? I haven't been able to concentrate. My hope with this scene was that the listener is sutured into the scene. They forget they're listening to a fiction podcast and for a moment, perhaps, experience the 1940s movie culture and also the psychological state and emotions of the characters. Audio allows for elements that are crafted very differently in prose. One last note on suture. When I'm working on designing sound for a show, I try my best to experience the story as a listener would. After I finish the editing and sound production, I listen to the episode in my car, on a walk with my earbuds in, on my computer. I try to be honest with myself and notice when I am pulled out, when the suture failed. That is where I realize I need to mend a stitch. Maybe the dialogue dropped the action. Maybe I spent too much time in exposition. Perhaps there's a sound that doesn't create the atmospheric element I want. By nature, literary fiction podcasting requires listener investment as they become drawn into this world. Okay, we discuss plot structure in serial versus episodic audio storytelling. Now let's explore the development of literary elements in long form podcasting. Since the goal is the payoff for the listener's investment early on, it's important to understand how to craft long form elements in serial fiction podcasting. Episodic stories may not need the same kind of attention to these elements. Mood, setting, and theme are all good examples. These are critical to the longer story form. Each episode is nested in the larger arc, and as your listener travels up these, that arc, these elements are landmarks and also tension builders. Listen in on the diarist as Andrea becomes increasingly immersed in Richard's bizarre life. In this scene, Andrea discovers the journals of Richard's deceased wife, Margaret. Oh, Margaret. You are telling the truth. Here they are. Ornaments. Ornaments. Ellen and Margaret. Ellen? Like basic literary elements, devices are also important considerations for long form podcasting. Many of these I address in sound design, which I will get into a little later. Instead of descriptions, word choice, language, we have an expanded palette to elicit associations through our audio auditory sense. As you look at this list, consider the ways you can experiment with sound to enhance your story. Foreshadowing, flashback, metaphor, motif. Okay, another clip from the diarist. Hello? Who's turned out the light? Someone is down here? By now, you should have an overview of the genre of literary fiction podcasting. You can find more resources in the handouts, and there are many great tools and resources online. I know of two writing groups where you can join for free. One is for podcasting, the other is for screenwriting. Both are listed in the handouts. However, beyond that, there are many, many great resources online. As I mentioned earlier, 
This training assumes that you have a story to work with. If you are creating one from scratch, you'll need some resources and support. I have some links in the handout. If you have a book or novella or even a screenplay that you've already written, then you are ready to create your own literary fiction podcast. Another idea, which I haven't done myself yet, but have thought of doing, is finding a book in the public th domain. Just this year, some very well-known and absolutely cap captivating novels are now in the public domain. The Great Gatsby, books by Virginia Woolf, sci-fi, political. This would be a great way to dive into literary fiction podcasting. So let's assume you have a, a novel or a long piece of fiction to adapt. Okay, remember I told you when I first started fiction podcasting, I was working on a novel called The Diarist. The first thing I did was mapped my plot. I decided to do it chapter by chapter, and my series followed that pretty closely. Although as the season evolved, I combined some chapters and added new scenes and episodes. In the end, The Diarist ended up evolving into a hybrid serial episodic fiction podcast. My second podcast, Exuberance's Beauty, stuck strictly to the long, fo long form plot of the novel and episodes are aligned closely with chapters. Here is the plot diagram for Exuberance. I ended up breaking the book into two seasons because the story had a natural stopping point and with the pandemic and everything going on in the world, the actors and I needed to take a break to regroup and start recording again. The episodes followed the book chapters pretty closely. In a moment, I will adapt a small section of prose and show you my process. For now, let's look at the episode arcs and the larger story arc. And this is in your handout. And um, this is the first season of Exuberance's Beauty. And that's the first half of the novel. And as you can see on the bottom, the gray represents the larger story arc for that season. And then within each episode, I have smaller arcs, I have conflict, and those together are building and following the larger narrative arc. And you can see this in the handout. Now let's dissect the adaptation of prose for audio scripting. First, let's compare the two genres from a listener's perspective. Just looking at the pages, you can see the writing process is different. When you listen and then dissect, you can see the mechanics of the writing is very different. Let's listen to the prose and then the scripted audio story. Just listen, get a sense of how the action is designed in both genres. This clip will run about two or three minutes. So it's a little long. It'll start with the um, me reading the scene from uh, the novel and then the actors and the sound fully produced episode clip. Um, and just think about what's different and what's the same. Darling, it will help with your morning sickness. Carmen offered me a small cookie. She looked into my eyes. I'd known her all my life. And as I reached over the seat for the cookie, I examined her in a new way. I knew all of her, her bright emerald eyes, her red painted nails. I was losing her too. My eyes welled up. Oh, sweetheart, don't cry. This is only temporary. Tell her she'll be back, Harry. In his usual manner, Harry nodded, but kept his eyes. Harry, pull over. I'm going in back with Evie. Harry pulled the car to the side of the road. When Carmen opened the door, there was a pungent, earthy smell. The weather was drizzly and wet. It was cold as it can be in court, Portland early summer. Here, Harry, put this in the bag. She handed it to him and moved closer to me. She put her arm around me, and I placed my head on her shoulder and cried. Look here, Evie. Harry. Isn't it pretty? All the trees and... Evie, are you awake, dear? Yes. I'm just... I'm awake. It's pretty. You hardly sound... Carmen, give her a break. Have something to eat, darling. It will help with your morning sickness. Here's a sugar cookie. I made your favorite. Oh, Eve, what is it? Why are you crying? <laughs> you know me, everything about me. The sugar cookies. Why do I have to leave you and Harry? Why? Why do? <laughs> oh, sweetheart. Don't cry. This is only temporary. Tell her she'll be back, Harry. You will. Oh, Harry, come on. That's hardly assurance. You'll be all right, Evie. 
Eve, you're gonna get crumbs on your dress. Here, take it. I'm not hungry. Harry, pull over. I'm going in back with Evie. Here, Harry, put this in the bag. What am I going to do without you? I've included some handouts in the, um, in the, I've included a worksheet in the handout. We're not going to do this now, but if you'd like to, listen again and see if you can identify the literary elements and devices in each genre and see how they are built differently in prose and in audio scripting. What we're considering is how to tell a story in writing and how to tell a story in dialogue. Script dialogue reminds me of laundry after it's been through a spin cycle. You've extracted out everything that surrounds it and left just the functional parts. As we'll discuss in a moment, the functional parts of a script is the, are the action. All the water that was extracted out of the laundry was the context or those literary elements and devices we talked about. Of course, you can't get all the water out. And so that dampness that remains in the clothing are those elements that you embed in the dialogue. That's why we always say show, don't tell. Showing is the dampness that's in the clothes, the subtext, the innuendo, the hints about plot, but really the purpose of the dialogue is just function or action. So what happens after all the water has been extracted out of the laundry spinner? Well, that's where sound comes in. Take a look at what came out of the laundry from the scenes we just listened to. Whether it's my show, The Diarist, or The Black Tapes, there are, or other shows that use narrator devices, there are ways, I just wanna do this quick, uh, caveat to the um, show not tell rule. Audio fiction allows you to do some kind of creative, innovative uh, devices for narration. And you might have already heard some where some shows um, use found audio, uh, like cassette tapes, and then they'll play those and that will narrate and share information that the listener wouldn't know otherwise. In the diarist, I use her diary. And so she's doing these monologues of her diary and her internal thoughts. And I use that device um, as part of the show's um, story. So there are times where you can tell the listener um, what's happening, but ordinarily you want dialogue to push action forward. That's what you want in any scripting and an audio drama that is very, very true. So the big takeaway with dialogue, uh, conflict, goal, action, uh, action, subtext. I like to think of dialogue as something other than social or personal. I think of it as mechanical or simulated. Dialogue is not conversation. It is not simply people talking to one another. Consider eavesdropping in a restaurant. Your ears perk up and you're drawn in, sutured in, when something else is going on beneath the words. Two friends are talking and one keeps correcting and contradicting the other. How about another person is, you, you're listening in and you can, you can tell one person is trying to break up with the other person, but the first person isn't getting it. The partner is oblivious to the attempts to break up. Um, the guy in line at the cafe is ordering a latte and the barista in front of him is chatting too long. Uh, with, the, with the person in front of him. And the, the business person behind them is getting more and more annoyed. What, what's happening is what's growing our, what's capturing our attention is the growing tension in conflict. We're trying to find out what's going to happen. That's the story. So in each of these examples, what's interesting to us is the conflict, the motivations, the goals, the subtext, the trick, though, is to make dialogue sound as natural as possible. That's what makes it confusing, but, that's, but, but sounding natural is just the dressing on the mechanics of dialogue and storytelling. In everyday life, words and conversations may serve other purposes. It's natural for us to have a conflict or ulterior motive, whether we know it or not, but in scripts, it's essential to have that conflict. So I've included some resources on um, adapting uh, 
uh, prose to script. But let's practice the process from another example from Exuberance's Beauty. What I'm going to share is a actual screencast of me adapting a, a written scene from novel to script. And so I'll have a screencast um, and we can do it together and you can see what I'm talking about. Um, it does take some work to adapt prose to dialogue and you have to kind of get used to switching, um, switching gears. Um, in my own process, I don't, when I'm writing the script, I don't add too much sound or direction. Um, maybe that's because I'm doing the sound design and direction. I tend to be the kind of writer that, um, that just lets gets into the zone and lets my creative process go. And then I'll do the editing or censorship, not censorship, but you know, editing and, and revising later. But I try to, once I get that flow going, I try to keep it going. Everyone's writing process is different. So find your style, um, practical aspects, like how you start, um, how you approach the writing process is as important as finding your voice. Uh, there are lots of resources to support writing, but I think getting really comfortable with the process and what you need to do, whatever it is to produce, is key. I like to write and keep writing, no censorship, and I've learned to kind of ride that inspiration and ignore uh, self-criticism. I'm not the kind of person who wants it perfect before I put pen to paper or sound into the, um, into the show. Uh, for others, that process may be different. Um, so just catch that wave of inspiration, however you do, and, and just work through it. Okay, so I'm going to do a screencast. It's probably about two minutes, and you'll see me adapting a, um, a piece of prose for, for, for audio script. Episode two. There's actually another episode. Um, so the scene is at the train night train station, Eugene, Oregon. We know it's 1945, but I'll write it here just for this screencast. Um, so the train's pulled into the station. Eve looks out the window, but she doesn't see Jeff. So we're going to have, like I said, sound effects. She's pulled into the station. Um, so all of this is internal. Maybe she's wondering, is it taking him long? Um, yeah, part wish she, she wishes she's ambivalent. Um, so we have her, um, I'll just say here, Eve. Um, so all of this, she's got all this stuff going on internally. She feels embarrassed, this charm bracelet that he gave her but that's not going to be, she's not going to say that in the script. Um, and then the baby is fussing with this toy. So, um, so we're going to say, um, Charlie here, shh, don't drop it. So she's trying to soothe him with her voice and with the toy. Here's your block. Here's your, it's not a block. Um, so we'll just say, don't drop it. We know he has the toy. So she exits the she exits the um, she exits the train, and now we, it is busy. Um, uh, people rushing, and then that's going to be sound effects. And then um, baby, then Charlie drops the um, throws the toy, and Eve looks around. I'm writing these directions and I would write these if somebody else was doing sound, but these are not going to be said. So the first thing, so Eve says that to Charlie and then a moment will pass and then she's tr still trying to walk. Um, she's frustrated. Um, so then... Uh, so then Jeff is Jeff now has picked up the toy um, that Charlie drops. And stands in front of Eve without saying anything. And these are just directions I'd probably give the actors, but I'm writing it here. Eve says, oh, Jeff, you, you scared. She's going to say like, 
you scared. Thank you. Here, Charlie. And then he reaches and picks up baby. Um, and then she's like inside, she's powerfully drawn. Uh, Jeff takes the baby um, and picks up her luggage, her suitcase. So now she says, um, this is like this, Eve says, this is the dialogue from the thing. Oh, I can carry it. You have the baby. And then he says, don't be silly. And then he leans and kisses her on the cheek. Um, and then we're going to have a moment pass. Or he kisses her on the cheek. You look beautifully. Very, very pretty. And now we've captured this where it says it was as if we were family, as if he were my husband. In this dialogue, in these actions, that is what the listener is going to convey. Um, things looked happy, but now she has a haunting feeling portending doom. So I'm, I'm going to do this usually in sound, but I'm going to have sound is the, um, is a low, a low hum of train approaching and maybe some music, subtle, dark music. So I'm going to have that juxtapose the sounds of the people, and then we'll say people dissipating. So now... So to wrap up the dialogue, dialogue moves uh, the action of the story. It's the vehicle, let's see if I can, oh, I'll do that. It's the vehicle carrying the listener up the story's, to the story's climax through conflict and back down towards resolution. That is the function of dialogue. Forget talking, telling, conversation. It is the structure of the story and believable natural dialogue is the dressing. In closing up your section on dialogue, try these to hone your skills. Listen to shows and zero in on the action of the dialogue. Study script writing. I've got a couple references in the handout. Another great resource is Stanislavski Actor Training. And it's a kind of an interesting tool for understanding, understanding character motivations and arcs. Because in doing that, it helps the actor find the action in the script so that they can set their goals um, for the scene, for the conflict. Before we move on into the next phase, here's a recap on adapting long form prose to audio script. Find a long form story, your own public domain, uh, develop one, and then adapt for literary fiction podcasting by mapping plot, mapping episodes, and um, make sure each episode has a subplot that's building as part of a larger plot. Write dialogue around major action in each scene. I highlight action because unless it's experimental, I structure the writing around the dialogue, rely on sound to embed most of the literary elements of the story. Once your script is done, you have the bare bone structures and ready to start sound design. Okay, sound design, uh, sound and literary fiction podcasting. Using sound in long form literary fiction podcasting. So we touched on the possibilities of sound earlier in the presentation. In particular, we discussed sound's role in literary elements and devices. The creative possibilities afforded by sound design is incredible. The synthesis of sound and long form podcasting has the potential for experimentation and also, I think, the development of completely new genres of storytelling opportunities. Before I start on this last section, I want to share a podcast recommendation with you. This is a story called Vermont Avenue. It won, it's not my story, but it won the Tribeca Award. It's the first time a podcast category has been included. This indicates to me that audio storytelling is taking off and listeners and producers are looking for compelling new genre making storytelling. There's something so new and elegant about the sound design in this incredible 14 minute fiction podcast. In this podcast, the creators tell the story of a man walking down a street in Los Angeles during COVID and running into a friend. 
It tells the story of their brief conversation. The man walks back home. The genius of this audio storytelling, in my opinion, is the sound design. It's so completely flawless and subtle. It's like 3D virtual experience of a moment. Um, it's short at 14 minutes, but the depth is magnificent. In this soundscape, we come close to inhabiting the mind of the protagonist. So much of this story is sound, exploiting the medium for so much untapped potential. I won't play a clip here because of time constraints and technical limitations of playing this back on the video, but I recommend it highly. Okay, so the last part of this presentation, the last few minutes, will be a demonstration of me designing sound on Exuberance's Beauty in my sound studio. This will show you how I move from bare script dialogue to adding the literary and the elements and devices we've talked about. There's a lot of serendipity that happens for me with sound design, and it's incredibly fun. Before I start, I want to make mention of a couple of technical aspects that are super, super important. First, um, there are resources in the handout for technical tools and training relating to recording, sound design, production, and distribution. I won't get into that here. That isn't my expertise. I consider myself still very early in my learning curve on sound design and production. The, the, the second and probably most important thing I want to mention is that um, you, it's really, really important when you're recording the dialogue to have really high quality sound going in. You can't do too much when the sound isn't very good. So you can't really fix it that, that well in, um, in, in the sound design software. It's, it's really hard to fix sound that isn't high quality. For dialogue, it's critical because it draws you out of the story. You, you can't get sutured in if there's uh, lots of technical problems or the, the, the sound um, levels are different or, or there's a lot of echo. Um, and there's tips on doing that, you can find it. Um, but the most important thing I think is a mic and mics today are not that expensive. They can hook right up to your, um, to your laptop or however you're recording and just some ways to kind of soundproof for echo. There's probably echo in this um, recording because I'm not in a sound, I'm just in a room. Um, but when I record dialogue, it's really, really important. So that, that's just my, my, big, um, my big note there. Okay, so I'm gonna take you with me on a sound design session using my story, Exuberance is Beauty. We'll start with the recordings of the actors, just the clips that I told you about. Um, I've already edited them for retakes and you know for flubs and everything and bloopers. Um, but I'm gonna drop these into the sound production software. I use Reaper, there's, um, there's free Audacity, um, although I think recently there was some malware issues, hopefully just check on that. Um, you can use GarageBand um, and there are other sound design programs. I use Reaper, that's what I've been using since I started. Okay, let's build a, um, a soundscape uh, experience. Oh, one more thing. Given COVID, I've been recording my show. I used to record in person. I've been recording my show on a, a virtual recording studio called Zencaster. And all of my actors record at home, from home. We make sure their sound is good. Um, and then I use those, those files. So we don't even meet up right now during COVID. As I'm designing sound, I'm going to switch from focusing on themes and literary elements and I do things with pacing. Um, I maybe might move, uh, create a little space in the dialogue or um, there's so much you can do and it's so fun and um, so much room for experimenting and expanding the story. Okay, let's go. So I'm gonna, this is a screencast of me doing some quick sound design. It's about four minutes. Um, and then after that, that's, um, then I'll just wrap up. In this short screencast, I'm going to show you or try to demonstrate for you what, um, what I was describing about how sound effects can serve um, and can provide many of those literary elements and devices. So in this clip, I have the dialogue from a scene where Eve um, and Frank, the farmer, they're just getting to know each other, just building a relationship. Um, and this is a scene on the farm. So here are the actor's dialogue 
WAV files, sound files, without any sound effects. Just over this way. Neil, I'll be back shortly. You ever milked a cow, Eve? <laughs> no, I haven't. <laughs> ever been on a farm? Oh, not like this. Here, give me your hand and I... Okay, so that's without any um, added sound effects. So if you, you, you can really choose how you want to do the sound effects. You could do minimalist with almost no sounds. Um, and maybe you would just, in that case, just do farm sounds in the background. And that would be it. And that would sound like so you're doing setting, you're doing description. So, you know, in dialogue, they wouldn't say, they could say, but, oh, look at this. I can hear the sounds of the birds. It makes me feel um, happy or like a child. Or um, I see the, the, the wind through the trees. Or You might do that, but it really would say more about the character. You really want to... Uh, try to avoid too much exposition and have the listener just experience it. So let's see what happens when we add that. Just over this way. Neil, I'll be back shortly. You ever milked a cow, Eve? <laughs> no, I haven't. <laughs> ever been on a... So that's with um, the farm sound effect effects a little more subtle. I like to put a lot of sound effects in, so uh, for whatever reason. And so I would put, I want to make it more immersive. So I'm going to put the, I have female walking in the dirt, and then I have uh, male walking in the dirt, Eve and Frank walking. And you have to adjust your sounds, but, um, okay, so let's see how this sounds. Just over this way. Neil, I'll be back shortly. So one thing I do is I try to also um, create a sense of place, sense of the experience, the person being there. So what I would do here is where he calls to Neil. I would just anticipate the sound of him stopping because he sees the other farm hand. Um, so we go back. Just over this way. Neil, I'll be back shortly. You ever milk the cow, Eve? So that adds a little more depth to it. And what triggered him saying, you ever milked a cow, Eve? Maybe there's some cow sounds in the background. And so you're going to place them. I'm going to put them kind of low so it's not comical. Uh, Just over this way. Neil, I'll be back shortly. So I might have actually put that cow sound a little closer. Maybe put one in the beginning. You ever milk the cow eat? Just over this way. Neil. I'll be back shortly. You ever milked a cow, Eve? <laughs> no, I haven't. <laughs> so then, um, so now they're about to get onto this tractor, right? So we've got, he's going to help her onto the tractor, and he's going to start the tractor. Oh, okay. And then the tractor is going to be driving. So I'm adding these, I'm layering, I mean literally layering these sound effects. Um, feel safe up there? Oh. All right, so she's not up there yet. He said, give me your hand. Uh, and, you know, volume is another level of depth. Um, I can't grab this for some reason. Volume is another level of depth. Panning, moving the sound. I'm not doing any of that. That's more sound design stuff. But Here, give me your hand, and I'll help you out. You feel safe up there? Oh, yes. It's fun. See the house. All right, so here what happens a little bit before he says see the house. So I'm going to give him a minute, and, and then you also can allow sound to create the mood. See the house over now. Wait. So I'm just playing with, I'm layering sounds, I'm playing with it. Um,
You feel safe up there? Oh, yes. It's fun. See the house over that way? Yes. Oh, Mary said you... So you just keep building like that, and you're building, you're building in the mood, the theme, foreshadowing that house that he just described as a house that's going to play a, a major role later. Um, some people use... Um, some people use music. I want to start, I do some, I want to start experimenting with it more. Some people use silence and then juxtaposition of sound or unexpected combinations of time. And so you're just thinking about the literary elements um, and as, as sounds, really, using soundscapes and also embedding it in dialogue. And here's just an example of what it could sound like with music. I, I probably wouldn't put this song here, but. See the house over that way. Yes. Oh, Mary said you would help the lady who lives there. She's going on 93. Known her all my life. Miss Livingston. So that gives you an idea of the sound design and the potential for uh, addressing not being able to put the descriptions and things like that in the dialogue. Okay, so that's about the end of our time. I hope you enjoyed hearing a little about literary fiction podcasting, and maybe this session's given you some ideas on for your own podcast. Please reach out to me and let me know what you think. You can reach me at DonnaBarrowGreen at gmail.com, and I look forward to listening to your long-form stories.